On the island of Newfoundland Upon the Sandwich Coast Lies the little town of Virgil To whom I'll sing this toast There are so many islands That lie just off her shores And when the cold north wind blows You can hear the billows roar The people from the village Make their living from the sea They like their independence It shows that they are free Some fish in their small boats In the wind Rain and sleep, while others make their living on the offshore called their fleet. They've known the sheer of tragedy down through the years, and when the memories overcome, they show their grief with tears. For they have lost some loved ones to the furies of the sea. For heartaches and heartbreaks are locked in memory. This village has got beauty carved on its rugged shore. Seven miles of pure white sand. Who could ask for more? The mountains and the valleys Where the rivers run so fast And the salmon rise to the sportsman's fly As he makes another cast Tell the people of this village Love their native home Anyone who goes away Oh, surely will return Just like that lifelong mystery The answer you won't know What makes this rugged village burn So deeply in your soul What makes this rugged Village burn so deeply in your soul. Good evening and welcome to this week in review. Tonight in our stories we have Reggie Martin's upcoming project, MP Judy Foot. Please stay tuned for these stories after this. We are kids. Wish kids. Ten thousand kids. We are brave. We are strong. We are fighters. Some days are good. Some days are bad. Some of us make it. Some of us don't. My wish will make me strong. The Children's Wish Foundation of Canada. Does a wish make a difference? You bet. You bet. Imagine the difference a wish can make. On my two more needles to my wish. Please give today. Reggie Marsden came by the studio to talk about a project that he has undertaken. In our studios tonight, I have with me Reggie Marsden. Reggie's going to talk about a project that he has gotten underway. Reggie, yeah, what about this project you're doing? What's this all about? Uh, the project is going to be in the Dominican Republic. Yep. It's a 10-day trip. Mm. Well, I call it a trip, but it's more of a working type thing. Um, we'll be building, I've been working with uh, about 100 students, all mm. together students and we'll be building houses, schools, other things like that, um, possible hospitals um, for the community. It's just to better the living situation for the people of that community. Mm -hmm. So each, the way it works, uh, you could be in one site working on a house one day, mm -hmm. the next day you could be maybe working on a school. 
So they just rotate, I guess, to make it easier on people or just to, so they get to see more. Okay. So what's the, the name of this project, Reggie? Uh, the name is Hero Holiday. Okay. So it's uh, through Absolute. Okay. It's a nonprofit uh, organization that they actually, um, their main goal is to better, obviously, the living conditions of a lot of the, the underdeveloped countries in the world. Mm. So they have, they, I know they have a group going to Haiti. Okay. And there's a group, this one is Dominican Republic. Mm. And they're, they do a lot in Mexico, too. Okay. So. Okay, very good. So when you get to the Dominican Republic, do you, you're going to be doing houses that you said. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, well, with the houses and stuff, uh, they're all made out of clay and brick. Okay. So it's uh, basic, just cement pouring and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not very, it's nothing like uh, high class, like I guess we could say it, like we see here. It's okay. all just clay, mud, rock, stuff like that. So through that, um, the people, um, there's a lot of people there that don't have jobs either. Okay. So they can't afford to obviously build houses. And there's a lot of people just on the street from the recent uh, earthquake in Haiti. Mm -hmm. They, uh, a lot of the people in Haiti, they crossed over the border illegally. And now they're just living on the streets. Okay. Dominican. Very good. So um, how do you plan on getting there? Um, well, first of all, I have to raise the money. Okay. Um, we, there's already organized through Absolute the, with the Hero Holiday, uh, the, tr the, the flight and travel from Toronto, Ontario, mm -hmm. and to the Dominican and back. Mm -hmm. But I have to book my own ticket and get it all organized for my travel from here to Toronto and back. Mm -hmm. And that's also with, um, like uh, accommodations and everything, all that. So. Okay. So you got any ideas? Are you going to raise the money? Uh, yeah. As of now, I'm just I sent out letters to most businesses and organizations in town, mm -hmm. just looking for donations, just for a to start off. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I have very little time because I didn't find out until late about this. Okay. So I'd like to do a bigger fundraiser, a major fundraiser, just to. Um, get them like a bulk of money mm -hmm. just because there's certain payment dates that have been met to pay all the fees. Mm -hmm. It's not so they don't expect it all one time. Mm -hmm. They have different dates for each one. So I gotta try to get so much money by a certain date and then the rest by another date. So I'm trying to get like a major fundraiser done. Not sure yet what it's gonna be, but if anybody had any ideas, any organization that could think of one for me. Oh, that'd be great. Yes, wouldn't it? Um, so, Reggie, what's your major reason for doing this? Well, that's something a lot of people ask me. And really, I do a lot of volunteering. A lot of people know that. I do a lot of volunteering. And helping people is just something I like to do. Mm -hmm. So, I'm always like, if I can get out and help more people, it's just something better. So, I like to take it to a new extreme take it and go down there, help these people that are underdeveloped countries and people, it's just, it just, for me personally, it would feel good and make my, like me feel good about myself, so. Oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's excellent. Anything else that, that you want to add to this, Reggie? Uh, no, 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 not right now. Okay, well, very good. Well, I hope you are successful in your fundraising. Thank you. And I hope uh, when you get it all done and come back, you'll come back and show us and tell us all about it. Yes, I'm sure I have lots of pictures and it, stories. Yes. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. MP Judy Foote came by the studio to chat with us about her re-election campaign. Good evening. In our studios tonight, I have with me our MP Judy Foote. Good evening. Nice to be here. Yes, welcome back. So I guess you're getting busy now with the campaign coming up and everything? Well, I'm in the middle of the campaign, uh, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, May 2nd is voting day. Mm -hmm. As you know, I've been the member of parliament for Random Beer and St. George's for two and a half years. Yes. I like the job. I really like what I do. And uh, I'm running for re-election. Oh. I want to come back as a member of parliament again for this wonderful riding. Oh, perfect. So in this riding, you got about 180 communities? There are 180 communities. And uh, someone said to me the other day, 
how do you campaign? I said, well, I'm going into all 180 communities in, in 36 days. Oh, possible. And, and, <laughs> and they said the same thing. Is that possible? And I said, you know, I make it possible, okay. including going to our isolated communities. And I have eight in our riding. Okay. And uh, someone again said to me, why would you do that when you could take a chance on getting stuck, you know, mm -hmm. depending on the weather at this time of the year? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, these people vote too. They have a right to be able to vote based on their judgment of who is the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. And the only way they can do that is to listen to what I have to say, to listen to what my opponent has to say, to look at what I've done in the last two and a half years, and then vote accordingly. Okay. So it's important that I think everyone who mm -hmm. um, wants a chance to speak to me gets that chance to do so. It's impossible to knock on doors. Yes. You know, within uh, 180 communities in 36 days, you can never knock on doors. So I really take advantage of an opportunity like this, mm -hmm. and thank you to Burjo Broadcast oh, no again that I can get into the homes of mm -hmm. people in Burjo and other areas. Um, but again, the important thing is, you know, I'll go into stores, I'll go into post offices, I'll go down on the wharves, I'll go wherever people congregate. Okay. So yes. that where I'm able, if I see a group of people standing up on the street corner, I'll jump out of my van and go over and introduce myself, and you know, and and say I'm looking for your vote on May second. And uh, sometimes they'll strike up a conversation on some particular issue. If they ask me about the weather, I tell them the weather's provincial. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's interesting how people don't uh, differentiate between what are provincial issues and what are federal issues. Okay, yes. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, we'll have the discussion. If they want to talk to me about the roads, uh, you know, I'll have to tell them, of course, now you have to talk to your MHA about that. Mm -hmm. But if you want to talk about employment insurance, if you want to talk about small craft harbors, if you want to talk about... Um, uh, pension issues, you know, things that impact on seniors federally. If you want to talk about some aspects of health care. Um, these are all things, immigration, those are issues. Uh, jobs in terms mm -hmm. of whether there are any projects on the go. Uh, the EI pilot projects, which are so important that we've been trying to get made permanent and we mm -hmm. can't get the Harper government to do that. Uh, but we're keeping at them, and they did extend them for uh, one until June, I think, and one until September. But these are pilot projects that the federal liberal government brought in uh, five years ago, and they should be made permanent. And we would, as a federal government, a liberal federal government, make them permanent. Okay. Uh, so those are the types of issues that are federal. Mm. Uh, I listen when people talk about provincial issues, mm. uh, because, of course, having been a provincial politician for 11 years, I'm able to relate to some of the issues that they raise. Yes but I'm also able to give them direction in terms of who to call and uh, what particular um, you know, department of government would be responsible for them as well. Okay, very good. So um, what is your theme for this uh, campaign you're doing this time? Well, you know, I looked at, uh, as I said before, I've been in federal politics now for two and a half years, and I've been sitting across from a prime minister who we obviously can't trust. Mm -hmm. And then I've listened to what they've been doing um, in terms of how they've been using Canadian taxpayers' dollars. So mm. then I thought about choices. You know, mm -hmm. we have to make choices. And then I thought about respect, mm. because I remember uh, the line that Mr. Harper used uh, several years ago now when he talked about Atlantic Canadians. And his position was that Atlantic Canadians have a defeatist attitude. In fact, he went on to say that they look at government favors as economic progress. Now that, for me, was so demeaning. Mm -hmm. That really told me what Mr. Harper, our Prime Minister, thinks of people who live in Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. And I know, Maxine, and you know, that there are no people more hardworking than Newfoundlanders mm -hmm. and Labradorians. Mm -hmm. And all, the same for all of Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. So I was really taken back by that, and I thought if someone can be so disrespectful of a group of people in Atlantic, Can Atlantic Canada who make up a part of this country, then why would you give him support? Why would you support him at all if that's how he thinks? And if he said that several years ago, that's a mindset. Yes. You don't change no. overnight, you know, uh, because all of a sudden you got a seat or something mm. in a particular province, you know, mm. or you found someone you liked in a particular province. So for me, that was so demeaning. So, you know, l look at trust, you know. Um, he signed on um, in writing for former Premier Williams mm -hmm. that the revenue from non-renewable resources would not be factored into the equalization formula. So the revenue that we would get from the oil industry would not be factored into our equalization formula. He put that in writing to Premier Williams during an election. Mm -hmm. And it was that was the reason why Premier Williams instituted the ABC campaign, because guess what he did after that election? He said, sorry, we can't do that. Even though I put it in writing, 
I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So that's why the following election, you had the ABC campaign. Yes. Now, I got no support from the ABC campaign, I can tell you that. Yeah. None of the MHAs, uh, and there are, we have what? Uh, seven MHAs uh, who are conservative in the riding of Random Bureau in St. George's. Mm. And none of them helped me in the last no. <laughs> federal election. So the votes that I got, I got because of who I am and what I'm able to do and because of, I guess, my background and people's knowledge of what I'm able to do. Mm. But, you know, that's a case in point of where the prime minister at the time put something in writing and after the election said, no, mm. reneged on that promise. Mm. So he comes to Newfoundland and Labrador and he says, we're going to give you a loan guarantee on the Lower Churchill. Mm. And oh, and we're going to put it in our platform, in writing. Mm -hmm. Well, why would we believe him this time? Why wouldn't we believe that if he wins seats in this province, if he forms a majority or a minority government after May 2nd, mm. why would we believe that he won't turn around and say, oops, sorry, I can't deliver on that. Yes. So trust. Mm. And this is also a prime minister that in the time that I've been there, the two and a half years, and looked at his record and what he's done since he's been prime minister, and he's been prime minister for seven years, I've looked at what he's done. He's broken 145 promises. Oh. That's a lot. Yes, it is. That's a lot. So you should never make promises if you don't intend to deliver. Mm -hmm. So when people say to me, you know, well, what are you promising us? I said, well, as Judy Foote, as you're a member of parliament, I promise you hard work, and I promise to always be accessible. That's what I promise. Yes. Now, as a government in waiting, we have a platform because we know that there are things Canadians need. Yes. So when you talk about choices, we've got the Conservatives under Mr. Harper who are spending $30 billion on stealth fighter jets. Now, we know they're going to cost at least that much. Mm -hmm maybe more. We're getting our numbers from experts because we can't get our number from the government. Mm -hmm. They won't tell us how much they're going to cost. Mm -hmm. $30 billion and going up. In fact, the same stealth fighter jets that the U.S. were interested in buying, the Pentagon in the U.S. now they're saying, oh, hold on a second now. Really, these are costing way too much. They're going up in cost significantly. Mm -hmm. But Canada is not even questioning it. So we're willing to spend in excess of $30 billion to buy stealth fighter jets for the military. And don't get me wrong, we need to have good equipment for our yes. men and women in the military. We need to have fighter jets. Mm. But if you're going to buy a car, you go out to the different car dealerships and you look for the car that you want for the best price that you can get it for. Yes. Well, with these stealth fighter jets, they didn't even go to competition. They just said, yeah, we'll buy that one. No competition whatsoever. And we are told that they could have saved significant amounts of money if they had, in fact, gone to competition. Mm -hmm. So you've got the stealth fighter jets. You've got the um, mega prisons. They want to build mega prisons everywhere. And for what? We had Stockwell Day, who was the minister responsible, stand up in the House of Commons and say, well, there's a lot of unreported crime. Well, excuse me, but you build mega prisons for unreported crime and you know what they're doing they're taking young people young people who will commit an offense we all make mistakes mm -hmm. we know we should be able to rehabilitate some people so instead of throwing people in jail because they make a minor mistake or even a serious one that they regret and we're able to rehabilitate them and they won't do it again but if you take that person and throw them into a jail where you've got hard-nosed criminals mm -hmm then they're not going to come out on the streets any better than they went in. No. So we need to be able to put money into preventive measures, mm. not building mega prisons. No. That's $10 billion price tag there, $10 billion. Mm. And you've got $30 billion in excess for the stealth fighter jets. Then their other choice they've made that we disagree with is giving the wealthiest, the largest corporations in the country tax breaks. Mm -hmm. The co large wealthy corporations right now in Canada, their, corp their corporate tax rate is lower today than it is in the U.S. Mm. And when Mr. Harper started, the corporate tax rate was at 18%. It is now 16.5%. By 2012, it will be 15%. And we're saying you can't do that. We have so many needs in our country in terms of what our families need, what our seniors, our youth, our children, single parents, what they need, 
that we really need to focus on their needs. We're talking about their tax dollars here mm -hmm. and how they're being spent. In terms of the corporate tax cuts, what we have said is they should stay at 18%. And it's still 25% lower than what the corporations uh, pay in, the, in the, the break they get in the U.S. So we're saying, why would we have a corporate tax that's lower in Canada than we have in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. So right now, that corporate tax break they get gives them, it's a $6 billion a year break that they don't have to pay into the federal treasury. We're saying, guess what we can do with that $6 billion? So it's choices. So you look at what we want to do as a liberal government. We talk about family care. We have a, what we call a family care package. Okay. Uh, you know and I know that in a lot of families, if not in most families, when an elderly loved one gets sick or a child gets sick, uh, in most cases, you can't afford to stay home from work to care for that child or that parent. You end up having to put them in hospital mm -hmm. or put them in a senior's home, uh, you know, for respite. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that if you want to care for that sick loved one, you should be able to do it in your home uh, or in their home. Mm -hmm. And what we will do is you don't have to quit your job to do it. We will enable you to claim EI for six months so that you can stay off work and still have an income. Okay. And you can share that with someone else in your family. So if you want to take three months, someone else in your family can take three months. Because we believe that families really matter, mm -hmm. you know. We know in families, too, it's really hard sometimes when young people graduate from high school and they want to go to post-secondary institution. Mm -hmm. They might want to go to a college or a university. It's very costly. Mm -hmm. So we're putting in place what we're calling the learning passport. And it's where we will pay money into the registered education savings plan. It already exists so we don't have to create a new vehicle for it. Uh, we will put in $4,000 to help you pay for your tuition. And if you come from a low-income family, we'll put in $6,000 to help you pay for your tuition. Because we believe if you get the grades, you get to go. Mm. There's nothing worse than having someone graduate from high school who's worked so hard and not be able to afford to go to university mm. or to college, or have it cost them so much that they end up owing a mortgage by the time yes. uh, you know that they graduate from university or college. So we believe in our young people. We believe that if you get the grades, you get to go. And that's why we want to take that $6 billion. And instead of doing giving breaks to corporations, we want to say, no, let's give it to families. Let's give it to youth. Mm -hmm. We also know that there's problems today with getting volunteers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have an aging population. Yes. And it's hard to get young people engaged and get them uh, volunteering. And we really need to focus on them. So we're going to put in place something we're calling Canada Corp. And that means that if you volunteer at home or abroad, and you're a young person between, um, and who, you know, if you volunteer here or outside of the country, that we will in fact give you a $1,500 um, grant toward your tuition. Oh, okay. So another way of helping young people, but as well as helping communities and helping volunteer mm. to make sure that we build up our volunteer base. We know volunteers are the backbone of, the, of any community. Yes. So we really need to build up that base of volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, health care. There's a serious issue with respect to health care. And I know health care is provincial. But there is an area that the federal government can take a leadership role in. And that is with respect to the uh, cost of medication. Mm -hmm. And I know as a cancer survivor, you know, 10 years now, thank heavens, mm -hmm. but yes. uh, a breast cancer survivor, mm -hmm. that uh, the needles that I used to have to use uh, would cost like $2,000 a needle. I had insurance. It wasn't a problem for me. Mm. But I have run into people because I had cancer. Of course, I get to know a lot of cancer patients mm. and uh, who can't afford the medication. Mm. So some of them, you know, have cancer and can't afford the me medicine that they need in order to help them uh, battle the disease. Mm -hmm. So we're saying we should be covering the cost of medicines associated with diseases like cancer. Yes. So that for us is really mm -hmm. important too. Even though healthcare is a provincial issue, there are aspects that we can look at from a federal perspective and say, we really need to do more here. So in terms of choices, you know, it's families. We need to talk about families. We need to put them first. We need to acknowledge that there are issues here. Mm -hmm. uh, on daycare, you know, in the larger areas where you have uh, two parents working, and in some smaller communities too, 
um, you know, and they have children, and they have to work. Yes. Today, two fam in a, in a family, you have to have two parents working, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it, because that may not always be what they'd like to do. Some parents would like to stay home with their yes. children, and uh, and they should be able to do that if they want to. Mm -hmm. So what we've said is we need to make sure that we have um, child care spaces available so that parents can, in fact, put their children in child care if they want to. We will also continue to provide that $100 a month that the Conservatives came said that they would provide, mm -hmm. even though they haven't been doing the daycare spaces they promised to do. We said, you know, because parents may need that $100 a month, we'll continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Another issue for us, and we hear it all the time, is the need to have high-speed internet uh, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've said is that within three years of taking office, we'll have 100% coverage of, of uh, high-speed internet throughout the country, mm -hmm. as well as cell phone coverage. Mm -hmm. Those are all issues, and I think of young people, you know, children who have to do courses, long-distance courses, yes. and some of them have to do it on dial-up, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and they lose interest, and it's so unfair. And uh, I heard of a young student who had a 90% average, and because she was having such mu so much difficulty doing a long-distance course, again, through dial-up, her average went down to, 90, to 72%. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fair to our children. Uh, it's not fair to our seniors. You know, Mr. Harper turns around and says, we're going to help our seniors. We're going to give them what works out to be an extra dollar twenty a day. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what I say? A lot of seniors that I run into can't afford to heat their homes and pay for their medications. No. And what I, you go into a home, and I've done it, where a senior is in there in the kitchen, and uh, that's the only room they live in. The doors to the other rooms are closed. They'll go into the bedroom at night, but during the day, they live in that one room. Mm -hmm. And it's because they can't afford heat. And what I've said time and time again is that they have to make a choice. And they should never. They've given so much to us. They should never have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And what I said to Mr. Harper is, what you've done is you've enabled them now to pay for the medications. They still go to an area, maybe to the church basement or to a shopping mall where their friends gather to keep warm. Mm -hmm. So maybe they can buy a coffee while they're there. Yes. You know, that's what he's given them. That is a total disrespect, mm -hmm. I think, for our seniors. When I talk about stealth fighter jets, you know, and the cost, $30 billion, our take on that is, our motto is, vets versus jets. Mm -hmm. And just let me explain for one minute. In Random Buren St. George's, I don't know if you know, but we have over 800 young men and women serving in the forces, mm -hmm. the Canadian forces, in all branches of the military. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they get out, of course, the issue for them, if they, you know, they're honorably discharged from having served their tours of duty, then they have to get a job. Yes. They have to get a job. And it's not always easy. Yes. And what we're putting in place is a $200 million uh, over, over two years, $200 million over two years, that will enable them to access post-secondary education. It'll pay for their books. It'll pay for their fees. It'll enable them to go to university or to college and get a degree that will enable them to be qualified for a job. Mm -hmm. And if the soldier, whether man or woman, that, who is being dishonorably discharged, or honorably discharged, excuse me, uh, can't avail of it, then his or her spouse can. Oh, okay. So we're making it possible uh, to help wherever mm -hmm. we can, our vets, mm -hmm. our young vets. Our older vets, we, there's an issue there to, with the Veterans Charter. And, uh, you know, there was a decision made that they would get paid a lump sum. Uh, we've heard from them that they prefer to have the monthly amount. It's much easier for them to plan their lives yes. around that. The Conservatives have heard that, and they have not acted on it. And what we've said is we will undertake to talk to our veterans and find out, in fact, if they would prefer to have the lump sum versus the monthly payment or vice versa. And whatever their preference is, that's what we will do. Mm -hmm. So choices, you know, you've got your stealth fighter jets, you've got your corporation, uh, large wealthy corporations getting tax cuts, you've got your mega prisons. Mm -hmm. We're saying no, let's focus on families. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on education. Let's focus on lifelong learning. So mm -hmm. starting with the very young to the very old, mm -hmm. you know, and especially our youth who should be able to go to post-secondary uh, if they want to do that. Mm -hmm. And we're, again, trying to send the message that this, what money we're spending is not our money. Mm -hmm. It's a taxpayer's money. Yes. It's your money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's anybody who lives in Burgio, right? Mm -hmm. It's their money. 
So what we're trying to say is we need to do with the money we have things that are in the best interest of the Canadian taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So that's in terms of choices. So mm -hmm. trust, choices, respect. As I said, if you have a prime minister who refers to Atlantic Canadians as having a defeatist attitude, then that is so disrespectful. Yes, for sure. So that's how I've been running this campaign, explaining to people what our position is, explaining to people what I know is a conservative position because I've lived it for two and a half years, mm -hmm. and putting it out there so that people can make an informed choice when they go to vote on May 2nd. Okay, very good. So um, another thing, too, uh, that's been an issue is the closure of Service Canada office. You're right, Maxine, and that was, I could not believe that when I heard that. And in fact, I stood in the House of Commons and put a question to the minister responsible, Diane Finlay. And when I heard that that was happening, I, I thought, this, this can't be. If you believe in rural communities, if you believe in rural Canada, mm -hmm. then you can't do this. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing is, and what they're still doing, and we have to continue to fight this, what they're doing is they're taking those service Canada community offices, like we have here in Burgio, mm. and they're saying, well, you know, because we're going to put more responsibility uh, into Service Canada, uh, we're going to close these offices that were operating like five days a week, uh, you know, and uh, where people could come and get help like, with mm. any number of federal issues, uh, get people to help them with applications. Uh, we're going to close those because now it's going to become much more confidential. And we're going to take people, in our case here, Burgill, we're going to take somebody from the Service Canada office in Portabasque, and they're going to travel to Burgio mm -hmm. and, and, and Ramia, it's the same thing, get the ferry then to Ramia. Mm -hmm. They're going to travel to Burgio, and they're going to work here for two days a month. Mm -hmm. So now your schedule in Burgio, you're going to have to try and make your life fit around the schedule of these people are going to travel from Port of Basque. And not only is it not good here, it's not good in Port of Basque. Because no. these people in Port of Basque have their hands full. Yes. So when you've got two people out of the office in Port of Basque coming to Burgio for two days a month, uh, who's going to pick up the slack there? And the cost associated with the travel, because when, when these people travel, they get paid per diems. Mm. The, the gas is covered or they get mileage, mm. uh, you know, so there's a cost associated with that. So you can't tell me that this is a decision that makes sense. No. They're removing a federal service from rural communities. In Newfoundland and Labrador, there are 14 affected. Mm. And uh, we've been writing to uh, Minister Finley. Uh, as I said, I stood in the House of Commons and I put a question to her on this. Mm. And when she came back with her line that, you know, the service will continue, that we'll have service Canada employees from Port of Basque or the nearest, she didn't know where Port of Basque was, but the nearest uh, service Canada office to where the community office used to be, travel there and provide this very confidential service for people. And uh, she said, you know, and it'll be a better service and suggested that I should support what they're proposing to do. And I said to her, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea of the geography that you're talking about here. And what you are doing is removing a service, you know, because people cannot fit their schedules around your schedule or that of a public service employee who has to travel mm -hmm. to a community where the service was normally offered. What if your roads closed coming exactly. down the Virgil Highway? That's happened yes. more than once. Mm -hmm. What if the ferry can't run to Ramia? Yes. So that means do you go two months? without having anyone come to Burgia and be able to uh, provide the service that people need? Uh, do people in Burgio have to travel to Port of Basque to get the service? It is so unfair and it just goes to show again that rural communities do not matter to this conservative government. Mm. Just, it just does not matter. Talk about a post office. We have a post office here in Burgio. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you saw in my last householder, I have been working for months to get the post office reopened at Burgoyne's Cove. And Burgoyne's Cove is out around Clarenville, that area, okay. for anyone who doesn't know. They did, I was assured when I got wind that the postmistress in Burgoyne's Cove was quitting, that they would find someone, they would uh, put out the process that somebody could apply, 
and fill that position. Mm -hmm. I was assured because I was so nervous. I get a little nervous when I'm dealing with the conservatives mm -hmm. and with Mr. Harper. So I was assured by Canada Post that I did not have a worry. That in fact, what they would do in the interim, they said, is they would put in roadside mailboxes while they were waiting to fill the position. Okay, you know. I said, all right, as long as they're temporary mm -hmm. and you will remove them when you advertise and you get a person to continue on with the post office service. They assured me that would be the case. Well, between that assurance and now, in the summertime, in the month of July, when people are on vacation or people are away working, they did a survey in Burgoyne's Cove and to determine whether or not people wanted to keep the roadside mailboxes or whether they wanted to keep the post office. Of course, the result they got, because you had so many people away, was people wanted to keep the roadside mailboxes. So when they moved on that. They mm -hmm. moved on that survey, and they closed down the post office. Mm -hmm. And the roadside mailboxes were there, the ones that were meant to be temporary. So people now, they get their mail in their roadside mailboxes, but if you have a parcel, you want to get a money order, mm -hmm. you have to travel to Clarenville mm -hmm. to do that. Now, you have seniors who can't do that. So I thought this, and I went to the minister responsible, Rob Merrifield, and I said, this is, you are saying you have a moratorium on post office closures in rural communities. Well, how can you close the post office in Burgoyne's Cove? And he said to me, he didn't know what I was talking about. I said, you've just closed the post office. I said, if you don't know, then you've got people doing things that you should get your head around, mm -hmm. because I'm afraid that that may be the tip of the iceberg. You close Burgoyne's Cove, what's next? Exactly. Are you going to close Burgio? Mm -hmm. Are you going to close Ramia? Mm -hmm. Are you going to close other rural community post offices? And uh, so I took it up with him. I wrote him. I gave him the information. I wrote Canada Post. I said, you did this in a backhanded way. Do it in the fall mm -hmm. when children are back to school, when parents are home. Do your survey then and see what you'll find. Mm -hmm. So we kept at it, working with the people of Burgoyne's Cove, and got the decision reversed. But it's, it's something we should never have had to do no. because if they were being truthful, the post office would never have closed. Exactly. So the position now of postmistress is being advertised again, or postmaster, whomever. Mm. Uh, as long as we have a post office and people have, can avail of this, again, a federal service that they're entitled to, they deserve, and they need. Mm -hmm. So those are examples of you know, rural communities who, if you don't stand up and let people know, that you count, and if I don't stand up as your member of parliament and take issue with decisions that are taken like that, then the government will just ride roughshod mm -hmm. over us, and we can't let that happen. No, exactly. So what about your position on the gun registry? I hear there's... I'm, I'm glad you asked about, about that position. thrown out. <laughs> yeah. The gun registry is one that uh, a liberal government brought in mm -hmm. um, before my time. Mm -hmm. Um, it became very costly, you mm -hmm. know, it ended up costing more than I think they anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was to um, make sure that uh, people are kept as safe as they can possibly be kept. Yes. Uh, a very good idea, very good idea. And uh, then of course the Harper government uh, decided, because out west people would rather not have the gun registry, and that's where Mr. Harper's base of support is, is in Alberta and provinces out west. So he took it upon himself, used one of his uh, backbench MPs, mm -hmm. wouldn't do it as the government, mm -hmm. uh, he wouldn't do it as passing a piece of legislation. He used one of his backbenchers to, in fact, introduce a private member's bill to um, get rid of the long gun registry. And uh, so that became an issue for a lot of members of parliament. Uh, for me, it really didn't become an issue, and, and let me tell you why. Um, I know a lot of people in my riding use a long gun for hunting. Mm -hmm. I know they use it for sport. And uh, they're people I know, and they're not criminals, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, for anyone to suggest they are is upsetting to me. Mm -hmm. I also know that uh, we have had instances in my riding, in our riding, where in one case in particular we had a, a father who shot his wife, then shot himself, left three children homeless. I have visited a lot of uh, women's shelters where I have heard horror stories. Um, I visited shelters, and it's not just horror stories about women being abused. We also have men who mm -hmm. are abused. I listen to the various police forces, and you know they tell us that they, in fact, check that gun registry 
11,000 times a day. Because when they get a call uh, to go to um, you know, an incident, they need to know what's in that home in the way of guns. Mm. Uh, so they do uh, consult that registry. I've heard doctors and nurses talk about what they've seen in hospitals as a result of uh, long gun uh, incidents. So for me, in, in uh, making my decision and how I was going to vote on that, uh, it came down to one thing. If one life can be saved, then that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters. So what we did, though, was said, look, right now the way the gun registry works is not right. It's not right to those men who have long guns for sporting reasons or who use it for hunting, who want to go out and, and shoot a few turs, mm. you know. Uh, it's not right that they should be treated as criminals. So we said we need to decriminalize it mm -hmm. so that we still want you to register your gun, your long gun, for all the reasons that I've just outlined. Mm. But you won't be treated as a criminal if you don't. You know, you'll probably get a ticket mm. if you don't register it. But we'll do away with all fees. Mm. There will no longer be fees to register your long gun uh, because the system is already in place. You've already paid your fee, hmm. so you will not have to, you know, if you're going to renew your license, you won't have to pay your F another fee. We'll also simplify the process. We'll make the form so simple that you won't mind doing it. Hmm. Again, because you'll be doing it for the right reasons. Hmm. You won't be doing it and, and thinking, I shouldn't have to do this. Hmm. You'll be doing it because it's not costing you anything to do it. You're re-registering a gun. You have it in your home, and uh, it'll be easier to do but you'll be doing it for the right reasons. And that is to make sure that there is a record of all lung guns in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, and I say this, you know, because I, I really believe that if you can save one life, we have to do it. I mean, the cost of a life. Mm -hmm. I say that, and then I, and I know, I know that, you know, maybe that gun wasn't registered. So maybe that couldn't have been prevented what happened where the man shot his wife and then shot himself. But I have to err on the side of caution and say, well, maybe it was. And maybe if the police had gotten there in time, you know, maybe uh, would have been able to prevent the deaths. I don't know. All I know is that from what I've seen, from what I've heard, uh, I think it's important to keep the long gun registry. And I also think it's important for, for those people that I represent, those wonderful men and women who are not criminals because they have a long gun, who hunt, mm -hmm. you know, for sport or for food, uh, they need to be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. And that's what we will do by simplifying the process and getting, getting rid of these fees, mm -hmm. which we don't need. Okay, very good. Is there anything else now that you would uh, like to add? Well, you know, I've... I've um, I want to thank Burjo Broadcasting. This is uh, every time I come here, and you know I've spent a good uh, bit of time in Burjo in the last two and a half years. Um, I've certainly been promoting our, uh, our Sand and Sea Festival, oh, yes. which is, and I was telling uh, any, anybody that I, I talk about Burjo with, I say, you know, it's the best kept secret uh, mm. that you really need to go there. And of course, I wasn't able to get there last year. It's really hard for me with 180 communities and so many events that I get invited to. Uh, to do everything. Yes. So I try and pace myself and, and go make sure that I get every weekend I'm somewhere in the riding. Mm -hmm. uh, people said to me, uh, well, do you live in Ottawa? And I said, no, I don't live in Ottawa. I live in Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, what I do is I, I go to Ottawa on uh, Monday mornings at 6 o'clock in the morning. I fly, and then I fly home Thursday night uh, when I can. Sometimes I can't fly home until Friday because there may be votes in the house. Yes. But uh, every weekend, I'm somewhere in my riding uh, attending an event, you know, whether it's a firefighter's banquet, that's where I'm going from here. Uh, well, no, that's not true. Tomorrow, I'm actually going to Grey River and Franceway. Mm -hmm. I'm overnighting in Franceway. I'm overnighting here in Burgio tonight. And then on Saturday, I drive to Port Basque to attend the firefighter's banquet out there. And these are wonderful, wonderful individuals, volunteer firefighters. I can't say enough good things mm -hmm. about them. And that's one other item, too, that I, I, I should mention. Um, we wanted to give our volunteer firefighters a uh, tax credit mm. as a thank you. So we said we would put in place a $3,000 tax credit that our volunteer firefighters uh, could use. Mm. And that would equate to about 
$450 for them. Mm. And uh, so we said we want to do that out of respect, out of appreciation, and because we're so thankful for what they do. And because we don't know sometimes when they go to fight a fire, we really don't know, uh, you know, if they're going into serious danger, if they're going to harm themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be able to say thank you to them because volunteer firefighters don't get paid. Some no. get, you know, an honorarium, mm -hmm. but by and large, they don't get paid. What did the conservatives do? If you look at their platform and uh, they came up, oh, yes, we're going to give you a $3,000 tax credit, but it's non-refundable. What that means is ours is refundable. So it doesn't matter what your income is. We're going to give you this anyway. Mm. So it's not based on income. All you have to do is put in 200 hours of free service, and that can be hours in training as well as fighting fires, mm. and you will get that $3,000 tax credit because it's the right thing to do. It's a thank you. We mm. don't care if you've made money. We don't care you know, if, if, if you're a senior, mm. right? Whatever your income is, you will still get that tax credit. The conservatives have said, oh, yeah, we'll give you the tax credit, but if you file an income tax and, you know, you don't get a return, uh, like if you make less than $23,000 a year, then, sorry, it's non-refundable. So you can make $50,000 a year, and you will be able to claim the $3,000. If you make $23,000 or less, you won't. Mm. Now, is that fair? Mm. That's not fair. Most... People I know, unless they go away to work in Alberta, they're not making $23,000 a year. Mm. So that's not an appreciation. That's not a thank you. That's just paying lip service to doing something that the Liberals said they're going to do. They're trying to copy us, but they're not taking it to that point where it's a thank you. Mm. And we really appreciate what you do. They're wonderful. Mm. So I'm in Port Basque on, the, on the Saturday night for the firefighters banquet. I leave there and I go out to um, drive out around Rose Blanche, Harbor Le Coup, Fox Roost Marguerite, but I get the ferry and go over to La Poyle. Okay. And I'm overnighting in La Poyle on Sunday night. Okay. So that way, uh, on this trip, uh, I will have uh, been to La Poyle, I will have been to uh, Ramia, Grey River, and uh, Francois. And uh, there are eight, so I will have uh, four more to go mm. uh, before May 2nd. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, the riding uh, is a wonderful riding, and someone said to me, you know, if they look at redoing the boundaries, and I think they're supposed to look at that in 2015 or 2016 or something along those lines, they said, uh, and you were consulted in terms of, you know, what changes you should make or how you should, you know, probably put some part of your riding into another riding because I do have one of the largest, if not the largest in the country from a geography perspective, mm. and the spacing out of the population. Uh, I go right from the tip of the Buren Peninsula, so if you take Fortune, mm. all the Buren Peninsula, you come across the Trans-Canada. I, I have Clarenville, I have Random Island, I have Southwest Arm, I have up, down the arm. I have, uh, then I come across to, um, you go straight across to the Coastal Bays area. You mm. go down to Harbor Breton that way. So I have all of that area, so Pools Cove, everything down there, you know, Ballorum, all the communities there, Hermitage, I have Con River. So I come back up, then I have to go through Scott Sims riding mm. to get over, and through Jerry uh, Burns riding, mm. to get over to the other part of my riding, when you come into Stephenville, mm -hmm. well you've got other areas outside of that, of course, Gallants and mm. everything along that area, but all that part of the riding, and coming down to Burgio, mm. and then going back up, and then I have uh, Stephenville, I have Stephenville Crossing, I have the Port of Port Peninsula, I have Port of Basque, and everything out that area, and all the wonderful communities, Heatherton, St. David, St. Fittens, all those along the way that you pass when you're driving to get the ferry mm. uh, to go across. We might want to touch on Marine Atlantic. Mm. Uh, but it's a large riding. But it's, I love the riding. And now that I've gotten to know all the communities and all the people, I'd be the last one that they would want to consult because I'd have to say, I don't know what I give up. There isn't one part of it that I would want to see taken out of Random Beer in St. George's mm -hmm. because I've gotten to know the people, the issues, and the communities. Mm -hmm. But just on Marine Atlantic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on Marine Atlantic, I find... Uh, it's a difficult position to be in. Um, I know that Marine Atlantic has been a very, you know, cause for concern for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear every side of the issue that you can possibly hear. 
you know, when I hear from people who are having difficulty transporting goods, so independent truckers, you know, they're finding that the large trucking companies are taking up all the space on the ferry. Uh, they may not use it, but they buy up the space, which yes, means okay. the independent trucker doesn't get on, the small trucking firms. Uh, I hear from people who, you know, uh, the fact that we they have to have a, um, a visa, a credit card to do a booking, yes. you know. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, they just don't have a good trip on the vessel. Then I hear from people who have a wonderful experience. And so what I've, what I've done, because, and don't forget, Marine Atlantic is, the Gulf is our Trans-Canada. Yes, exactly. Right, it's yes. our Trans-Canada. And our tourists, majority of them come via Marine Atlantic. Yes. So the last thing I want is to be on the airwaves all the time complaining about Marine Atlantic mm. because I don't want to interrupt our tourism mm. season. I don't want tourists to start thinking, well, I'm going to start to stop at Nova Scotia and go and work my way back. Mm. I want them to have confidence that we have a good service, that they can come to Newfoundland, that it's safe to come on Marine Atlantic. I want them to have an enjoyable experience. Um, so I'm very careful about what I talk about on the airwaves when it comes to Marine Atlantic. But I talk, and I talk on a regular basis with the CEO of Marine Atlantic, with Wayne Follett, and with the CEO of the board of Marine Atlantic, with Rob Crosby. Okay. And I do that because I know both men, and they know that you know, I am going to be on their back time and time again. Every time I hear a complaint, I pass it along to them. And every time I do, I say, I want to know what you're doing about it. And that's the way that I work on the Marine Atlantic file. Because I want people coming to the Sand and Sea Festival. Yes. You know, I want people coming to everything we have to offer mm. in this province. And I know in my own riding, in our riding, we have some wonderful events planned all the time. And there are people that are coming on those ferries. So one of the things that, that I did suggest that I would like to see change is that now that they have leased vessels for five years, I wrote to Rob Merrifield because he's also, I mean, he's the minister responsible for Crown Corporations, which also happens to be Canada Post. Mm. But I wrote to him, and I wrote to John Baird, who is the Minister of Transport. I said, for five years now, you've, you've got vessels leased for five years. Mm. What a golden opportunity to build vessels. Mm. Because you know now what the requirements are. Mm. You know the capacity that you need. You know what you need in terms of being able to dock, you know. And you've got five years now to plan, design, build, yes. uh, purposely built vessels uh, to land in Port of Basque. Why don't you do that? And at the same time, create employment. Yes. I've got a shipyard in Marystown that would welcome, especially now in light of uh, Kiwi pulling out of the, uh, the uh, shipbuilding strategy, the federal mm -hmm. shipbuilding strategy, which is going to have an impact down on the Bureau Peninsula. Mm -hmm. But I keep thinking, like, here we need vessels. We're leasing them. Why don't we purposely build vessels for that run? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't hear me jumping up and down about Marine Atlantic on the airwaves because I don't want to harm in any way, shape, or form our tourism industry in our province. Mm -hmm. We depend on it. Mm -hmm. You know, we depend on it. Uh, in a lot of cases where, you know, we're waiting for the fishery to rebound, a lot of our rural communities have turned to tourism in the interim. Um, and, and they need that. They need a viable tourism operation during the summer months in particular. Mm. So you have to be very careful. You have to walk a very fine line. And, uh, but those in power at Marine Atlantic know only too well uh, how I feel. Mm. And uh, they know they're going to hear from me, and they do on a regular basis when uh, I hear complaints. And I do hear them. People call me. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, and at the same time, I get people, because I'll purposely say to people, how was your, how was your crossing? You know? And I spend time in Port of Bass. So you know, I've got over 300 employees uh, who are my constituents who work uh, in Port of Basque as well. Mm. And sometimes I'll say to them, you know, um, uh, you know, people, y you have a job to do, and it's really good to be respectful of the customers you're dealing with, but I know that sometimes they have hard days too mm. because people aren't always respectful of them. Yes. So, you know, it works both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... Uh, I thank you for this time, I, you know, and uh, I know that you're always available when I, yes. when I come to Burjo, Maxine, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that. And you're looking so well. Oh, thank you're looking you. so well. Um, and I really do. It's good to get in into the homes. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, you can't knock on all the doors. No, exactly. No. In 180 communities, 36 days, it's impossible to mm -hmm. do. 
So this allows me to get into homes, it allows people to know what I'm about mm -hmm. and uh, what I stand for and why I want their vote again on May 2nd. Mm -hmm. And they have the advance polls, on, but it's on Easter weekend. Yes. On, I can't believe it's on Good Friday and it's on uh, Saturday and Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, but you know why that is? Mr. Harper could have had the election on May 9th. Okay. He chose to go to the Governor General on Saturday following the contempt of vote in the House of Commons. He didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. He could have gone a week later. He could have asked to have the vote on May 9th instead of May 2nd, which would have ensured that we wouldn't have had the advance poll on Easter weekend. Yes, okay. So, you know, whether or not people choose to vote on Easter weekend, the advance poll, that's entirely up to them. If you happen to be in a location uh, where you can go any day and vote, like I know, um, you know, in communities like I tell people on the Bureau Peninsula, any time you go over to Marystown, you can go into an Elections Canada office and vote any day. Because, oh yeah, you don't have to be, you don't have to wait until May 2nd. Okay. So I expect there's probably the same situation in Stephenville, mm -hmm. where you can do it there. I haven't uh, checked it out. But it's May 2nd. Uh, again, uh, I encourage people to get out to vote. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did this year, because I think it's so important, you run into people who don't vote. And, uh, and I keep saying to them, you know, you have to vote, not necessarily to vote for me, but it's your right. Mm -hmm. It's your right to vote. So take advantage of it and vote. And then I talk to them about, you know, my, where, I'm, where I'm coming from. But I say, you know, I want you to vote no matter how you vote. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know I'd like to have your vote, but the choice is yours. Mm -hmm. So this year what I did was I wrote to everyone I knew who had graduated and who had turned 18 since the last federal election. I wrote them a nonpartisan letter and I said to them, congratulations, you have now reached the age of 18, you are now eligible to vote. I explained the process to, to them, I explained all the parties that you know they could vote for the Conservative Party, for the Liberal Party, they could vote for the NDP Party, they can vote for the Green Party. And they can vote for the rhinoceros party if there is a rhinoceros party. The only party they don't get to vote for is the bloc, uh -huh. and uh, which should never be a part of the federal House of Commons. But that's another that's another interview. Uh -huh. uh, so I wrote to them all, and I encouraged them to get involved, look at the platforms of all of the different uh, parties in the running, mm -hmm. and decide who they want to support. Because I think it's so important. And I have met on the trail so far at least 20 young men and women who are voting for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it's so encouraging to be able to do that. And while I was on the Port of Port Peninsula, um, before coming down to Burjo, actually, I was on the Port of Port Peninsula, and a teacher invited me into uh, Eco Saint Anne to talk about the electoral process. And, and I did that, again, in a nonpartisan way. And I commend that teacher, Marcella Cormier, uh, who you know, invited me into the school to come in and talk to the students about elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I didn't say to them you should vote liberal or conservative or any other you know, stripe or, or political party, but to make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course some of them, you know, there were only four or five there who were 18, but you need to reach them at that young age to get them yes. understanding the system and getting them to vote. Mm -hmm. So if there are any seniors out there who need a ride on election day, I'm hoping there are those in the community who will offer that ride yes. because we need to be able uh, to ensure that those who've given so much to us in the way of our seniors get the opportunity to uh, to cast their vote on May 2nd. Okay, well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for uh, dropping by and chatting with us. Well, it's again, it's a privilege uh, for me to be here with you and to be able to go into the homes of people in Burjo. This concludes our program for tonight. Thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>